Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second of two sessions that we have this evening on questions and answers. I'm still Amjad Muhammad. I have been Amjad Muhammad since the beginning of the program and I hope to stay like that till the end of the program and even beyond, to be honest. Um, we will be with you for another maybe just under half an hour now and uh, just remind you if you needed reminding. This is Q1A, so we're waiting on your questions. So please do get your questions into us. Either you can ring the studio directly, and that would be on 01274 214 299. That's 01274 214 299. But if you're feeling a little bit you know, shy, a little bit camera shy, or even voice shy, or telephone shy, whatever the phrase is, then we have gone out of our way to produce an email address, which is Q&A at ikra.tv. So you can send your questions in and our producer will either read them out to me uh, or he will put them on the screen in front of me so I can see the question and I can then A, read out the question to you and B, give a response. In the meantime, whilst we wait for that, we tackle some of the burning questions that I had on my group or groups, the forums that I have where istifta, the questions come in and alhamdulillah our entry was empty after about 15 minutes or so which is great and now what I'm going to do is like I do is to just give you some uh, points on the benefits of seeking knowledge because in essence that's what this program is all about. It's about seeking knowledge and what are the fadail of seeking knowledge what are the benefits of seeking knowledge? So let's get started. Okay. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This hadith has been reported by Abu Huraira radio anhu. Man da'a ila huda kana lahu min al-ajri mithlu ujuri man tabi'ahu. La yanqusu thalika min ujurihim shay'a. Wa man da'a ila dolala kana alayhi min al-ithmi mithlu al-athami man tabi'ahu. لا ينقص ذلك من أثامهم شيئا. comes in Sahih Muslim this hadith, in which the Prophet of Allah, Prophet of Allah, Ali Salatu Salam, is reported to have said, "من دعا whosoever calls towards guidance, من دعا إله دعا whosoever calls towards guidance, كان له من الأجر مثل أجوري then he will get the reward similar to the rewards of that person who follows him. لا ينقص ذلك من أجورهم there will be no reduction in that from their rewards in any way, shape or form, shay'a. What he means here is that when you call people towards good, there's another narration, man da'a ila khayrin, so that person who calls towards good, falu ajru mithli, then he will get the reward similar to the one who acts upon man amila ala khayrin, or words to that effect, then that person will get the same reward with no reduction to the person who's actually done the job itself. So calling people towards good uh, is a very rewarding role. And the other advantage, sometimes people think, oh, you know, if I call towards good and the other person does the act, then I'll only get half the share and he gets half the share. You know, like when you do business, you know, like if there's a partnership and you play a certain role and he plays a certain role, then you know that if you involve too many people in, in the partnership, then, you know, the, the money comes in, a thousand pounds and half goes to him and a quarter goes to him and a third goes to him and an eighth goes to him and whatever's left over comes to you. But you think, you know what, greed gets you and you think, if I didn't have him, I would have had his share. If that guy didn't exist, we'd have shared his share, you know. And maybe I eventually would have ended up 50%, 50%. It's far better than what I've got now, which is, you know, 8.5% or something. Um, and that's only because there is a limit to the amount of money which comes in. But this reward which is being given is by Allah. Allah is giving that reward. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving that reward, okay, if he's the one that's giving the reward, then he has no limit. His treasures have no bottom. It continues forever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give the same amount of reward to every single person in the chain. I'm now live speaking to you here from Bradford Ikra Studios, talking to you at home. I say something worthwhile, you listen to it, it impacts on you, you don't do anything, but you go share it with somebody else, your children, 
Your children listen to you, but they don't act upon it. They go to school tomorrow and they mention it in school to a friend. Their friend doesn't do anything. He goes home. He mentions it to his mum and his mum acts upon it. So look how many people there were. There's me mentioning it to you, you listening to it, you t t mentioning it to your child. That's two people already. Your child going to school, mentioning it to his schoolmate. That's three. Okay. If we include me, that's four. Then that schoolmate going home and telling his mum, five. It's it only when he gets to the fifth person that somebody actually acts upon it. The fifth person. But when that person does good, then that person will obviously get the reward because they've done good. The child will get reward because the child told the mum, so the child will get the reward. The child's friend will get reward, i.e. your child, because they told their friend. And you will get the reward because you told your uh, child and I will get the reward because I was the one who told you. Now it's not as though there's five people so we're going to get like 20% 20, 20 each because there's like you know X amount is the reward and because there's five partners in the reward we get like 20% each. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the same amount to me and the same amount to you to whatever. Obviously the closer you are the up the pecking order so to speak the more reward you will get because the woman wouldn't have acted upon that if a child didn't tell her. And the child wouldn't have shared it with them if the other child hadn't told them. And your child wouldn't have shared it if you hadn't told them. But if I hadn't told you, then you wouldn't have known. But obviously, ilm didn't come from me. Knowledge didn't come from me. Knowledge has come from the books that I've read. The teachers who've taught me. So then they'll get a reward. Then whoever was the author of the book, he'll get the reward. And then whoever taught him will get the reward. Until eventually, guess who he reaches to? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Because he was the initiator. And obviously prior to that, it will go to uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, Because Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, brought the uh, revelation to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. But then when you really, really, really look at it, it all goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he is the source of all good. And all knowledge belongs to him. And it, all it does, if we were to retrace its steps... It will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shared reward with every single person along that chain. No less. But, and there is a but. This is a double-edged sword. You know, meaning, or this is, has to be understood in equal measure on the other side. What do I mean by that? وَمَنْ دَعَا إِلَىٰ ضَلَالَ That person who calls towards deviation. Then the sin will be upon him mithlu athamin mantabi similar to the sin of those people who copy him. La yan min athamihim shaya. There will be no reduction in their sins at all. Now, okay, God forbid somebody initiates a sin. When they initiate a sin, Somebody watches them and copies them and does it. Or they just mention it. Oh, guess what I saw yesterday? I saw so-and-so doing such and such. <gasps> All right. He just tells somebody. He doesn't even act upon it. He just tells someone. That other person tells somebody else. Oh, my God. Thingy was telling me that thingy was doing such and such the other day. <gasps> what? Until eventually he gets to the fifth person. And it's the fifth person who actually goes and copies that guy. However, all these people were in the chain of it and all these people will also be dragged for that particular sin with no reduction whatsoever. Anyway, before I move on to the next hadith, I've been told that we have a caller waiting. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear caller. Wa alaikum assalam. Well, so I've got a quick question for you, please. Jeev, Jeev, fire away, brother. Uh, my, my missus is expecting um, and we just wanted to know a quick um you know, meaning-wise, in terms of, of name, because we've had a bit of a mixed response. Um, for a girl, we are thinking Aya, spelled A-Y-A-H. Okay. Now, is that permissible to keep such name? Okay, I will answer that uh, live, inshallah. Jazak my brother. Jazakallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa So, picking a name for a child is a very important task. The name you pick for a child has an impact on that child. Um, so therefore, one has to be very careful that they do spend good time and be considerate in choosing the right name. Ayah, as the brother says, it means sign. Okay, that's what it means, a sign. So like we have the ayat in the Qur'an, 
Each one is a sign. Each one indicates, what, what is a sign? A sign in, is something which indicates towards something. It tells us something. So like when you're, let's just take a very mundane example. When you're driving a car down the road and you see, you know, the 30 mile an hour sign, that's telling you that you need to operate at a certain speed. Okay, otherwise you're going to get done or something. If, for example, you're on the motorway and the signs now say to you that such and such lane is closing and the arrow is pointing that you need to slowly move across as there's only two lanes, means if you don't act upon that, then potentially you're going to crash your car. Because especially if you're in the third lane and you're zooming ahead at 70, 80 miles an hour and not looking that I need to kind of filter, uh, you know, move across. So signs help us. They tell us where to go. They tell us how to get there. They tell us what we should be aware of and things of that nature. So naming a child Aya, there's no, nothing wrong in that. In that she's a sign. Sign of what? Well, obviously this would be a belief that she is a sign towards goodness, uh, towards, in, you know, because, you know, everything a sign, like, for example, me having a beard is hopefully a sign of religiousness. That does not mean anything that I'm a pious person, but it's a sign of religiousness. It reminds people of Allah. It reminds people of the Prophet, I'm wearing a hat. Okay, it reminds people about Islam. It reminds people about act, act, religious acts. So these are all ayat. Okay, these are all symbols. These are all signs. So similarly, a child can be called ayah as in a sign. Um, you know, there's no, there's no harm in that whatsoever. So there's no, nothing for a person to be concerned about because they're not necessarily here referring to the ayats of Allah, i.e. the Quranic ayat. Uh, they look, they're using the actual term of what the word ayah means. Okay, I hope that helps my brother. So we have another caller waiting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, uh, I just ask one question that uh, if somebody sees some uh, signs of, for example, like, uh, uh, like you know, when you have some kind of black magic or anything, you see something passing around you, you know, like some sort of uh, shade or something like that. And uh, if, if, if you feel like, you know, you have something on you, so how would you can... Uh, eradicate these things and mitigate these kind of signs and you you know when for example um, I have some issues like for example in uh, in the weekdays from Wednesday and Thursday uh, me and my missus we have uh, this kind of feeling that if something is in, in a house or some kind of shade or anything which actually affects us and start giving us trouble like it, it caused some kind of misunderstanding between us uh, kind of some something like it's something in the house or anything so and uh, and uh, just uh, so these are the things which which actually giving us too much problem we are also reading uh, surah manzil but uh, it helps us uh, but i i don't know something still like it gives us some mentally you know psychologically some disturbance okay so how would you i mean give us some um, please advise or how, you, how we can do something okay. to avoid these things We'll do, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, my brother. Uh, so it looks like uh, today is ayah after ayah, so sign after sign. So this is a different type of sign or more like a feeling uh, where the brother is explaining that if they feel kind of a, a presence or, or a darkness, uh, maybe even visually see it. Normally when we speak of black magic or the hasad or the evil eye as it's referred to as well, then these are all things which, which are from the unseen, meaning that they occur in the unseen world. Uh, their, their impacts are in the real world, in the seen world, but they are, occur in the unseen world. So it's very rare for you to experience something visually. So if you are experiencing something and you feel that it's uh, of a devilish nature, it's of a satanic nature, and it's, uh, it seems the fact that it's causing, whenever these things occur, uh, then it impacts on your behavior and it impacts on your wife's behavior, uh, especially that is taking place on particularly a couple of days, uh, then you may need to look at, is there something you do different on those days uh, in your behavior? Do you, do you do something different? Is it because, because you know, if, ever, if there's somebody behind it, let's say, let's just assume there's nobody behind it, then why would it be that satanic, you know, demons of sorts visit your house on particularly two days? and they choose not to visit on other days. So there must be something that might happen on those days in particular, uh, whether it's a, you know, an act of worship that's, uh, that's amiss or something that's not right, 
so, you know, that would be my first thing to look at is, is, is you know, have an introspective assessment of your spiritual state. That would be the first thing. Uh, if you find that there's n your behavior is no different Monday to Tuesday and uh, Friday to, well, sorry, from Friday to Tuesday, that your behavior is no, 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 pro no different at all compared to Wednesday and Thursday, then maybe you need to just uh, uh, recite more uh, and uh, uh, try to do more acts of, uh, of goodness. Remember the, the, the shayateen and the uh, demons of sorts only come in houses where they feel comfortable. They don't come in houses where they don't feel comfortable. We know from narrations that even when the iqama is, uh, the adhan is being called, shaitan runs. When the iqama is being called, shaitan runs. Okay? The devils run. They don't like that. When Allah is remembered in a house, the shayateen run. They don't like it because they don't want to hear it. So they won't, they're not going to hang around, in particular, around anybody if they're praying, if they're acting according to the ahkam of Allah. It's when we're not acting upon the ahkam of Allah. For example, let me give you another example. Um, we're told not to have taswir in our room. Pictures, imagery, uh, toys, um, you know, laying there. Why? Because the angels of mercy won't come into your house. And the demons and the devilish creatures that, that roam around will come in. So then that makes things difficult. Also, depends what kind of things we're watching on, on the TV, if we have a TV. Depends what kind of things we're listening to. Because again, if it's something which has got music in it, if there's a lot of, you know, um, inappropriate behavior on the, uh, on the TV and we're watching that, then again, the, the devilish and the demons will come. But the angels won't come. The angels will scarper. They'll go completely the other direction. So when we lose the angelic presences and we're left with the devilish presences, then we have no protection, you see. Um, and then we can only protect ourselves. And that would mean, obviously, that we need to make sure that we're reciting regularly. So it's, you know, it's that kind of level of analysis that we need to do. Um, you know, there are, you know, people who can do black magic of sorts, uh, but it wouldn't be in this kind of, you know, structured way like that. It would be something that would bug the person all the time, not specifically on a certain day. Or, or a certain time, uh, they would be persistent with that person. But even then, even if somebody's done black magic, uh, there is ways of dealing with that. Again, if a person's ibadat, if a person's house is run according to the, the rules that Allah has given, then what is more powerful, black magic or Allah? Obviously, the answer to that is Allah is. So if he is our mawla and we are living our lives according to the way he would want them to, and we ask him for help, then there's no black magic on the surface of the earth that can ever stop it. And there's no devilish behavior on the surface of the earth that can stop him. So, you know, he has to be our main point of connection. And what I find, and I'm speaking generally now, not with regards to the brother phone, is what I find is that, you know, whenever I've done these kind of questions, you know, there was a very similar thing, I've got a few minutes left, is that a young girl was, uh, was basically, uh, you know, contorting into really weird shapes and she was sort of screaming from like literally the pit of her belly some really strange screams so this father rang me and he hadn't slept for days and poor brother looked disturbed and he says look you know Mufsab, um i'm uh, i'm really disturbed i think my daughter's possessed and and and, and whatever. so i said look i would have to come to your house where do you live he lives somewhere down in southampton or something silly like that and i said look that's quite a distance away from Bradford, um, so you know, let's see if we can discuss this before I have to make travel arrangements. And he says, "Look, please, can you watch her?" I said, "I'd rather not, uh, because she wasn't baligha yet." But I said, "I still rather not." Uh, but he said, "No, she'll be within the cover of of the uh, uh, the bed, and I just want you to see her moving and and, and whatever." So you know, so he put the camera on her for a few minutes. I could see what she was doing. I said, "Look, let me speak to her." Um, so I talked to her and I said, you know, what's going on? Now, would you believe uh, when I asked the family, I said, look, do you pray Salah? Uh, do you recite Quran? You know, do you do this? And I was getting, you know, like textbook answers. You know, we pray all day and, you know, I, I, I do this. My wife does this and we give sadqa all the time and we recite Quran all the time. And it's like, you know, su a very Sufi house. Um, but when I started was carrying on talking, then eventually, you know, things started to give. Uh, you know, we need to be more 
punctual with our prayer. And I thought, oh, hold on a second here. Just half an hour ago, you said that you pray regularly. Uh, we need to recite the Quran more in our house because it's been like three months we haven't recited the Quran. So I thought, oh, hold on. You just said to me that you... So sometimes, you know, we, we want to give the textbook answer because we want the problem to just disappear. And we just don't think it's because there's no spirituality in our house or there's no ibadat. And sometimes we feel a bit embarrassed, don't we? That, oh, I don't pray, I don't fast. I do this, I do that, I watch this on the TV, I do this, whatever. We feel a bit embarrassed to share that with a scholar. So we start saying those kind of things. But would you believe what the answer was? Well, the answer was, and I got to that within two hours or three hours, and it saved me having to drive down. The answer was that the poor girl had obviously stomach issues, and she wasn't allowed to eat anything spicy or drink anything uh, uh, with acid, and she had a sneaky supply of uh, pop cans under a bed. Um, I won't name the brand because I don't think it was the brand was the issue. So she had a sneaky supply of uh, cans under her bed. And when it got to night, when everybody had gone to sleep, she'd slip a can, have a drink, literally on an empty stomach. And then at night, obviously, it was causing a, uh, there was like gastrointestinal problems, uh, which was making her in, squeal in pain. And that's why she was contorting. But she didn't want to tell her parents that she was drinking a, a, a crafty can uh, after, you know, late at night. So look at the answer. The answer was so simple. It was a physical uh, problem, a medical problem, which was impacting on her. And it looked like, you know, somebody had done, as they claimed it, she was possessed. Uh, so we get a lot of these kind of possession things going on and, you know, and the rest of it. And, you know, you always, you know, it should be, uh, but anyway, not enough time for possession. Maybe another time, maybe tomorrow. So anyway, I take your leave. Jazak uh, for the two callers. And inshallah, I hope to see you tomorrow. So till then, uh, I pray the best for you and I pray the best for myself. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.